Chapter the Seventeenth, Book the Second of Little Dorrit. Read for LibriVox.org by Ellis Christoph. Little Dorrit by Charles Dickens, Book the Second, Chapter the Seventeenth, Missing. The term of Mister Dorrit's visit was within two days of being out, and he was about to dress for another inspection by the chief butler whose victims were always dressed expressly for him, when one of the servants of the hotel presented himself bearing a card. Mr. Dorrit, taking it, read, "'Mrs. Finching?' The servant waited in speechless deference. "'Man, man,' said Mr. Dorrit, turning upon him with grievous indignation, "'explain your motive in bringing me this ridiculous name. I'm wholly unacquainted with it.' Finching, sir, said Mr. Dorrit, perhaps avenging himself on the chief butler by substitute. Ha! What do you mean by finching? The man, man, seemed to mean flinching as much as anything else, for he backed away from Mr. Dorrit's severe regard, as he replied, A lady, sir. I know no such lady, sir, said Mr. Dorrit. Take this card away. I know no finching of either sex. "'Ask your pardon, sir. The lady said she was aware she might be unknown by name, but she begged me to say, sir, that she had formerly the honour of being acquainted with Miss Dorrit. The lady said, sir, the youngest Miss Dorrit.' Mr. Dorrit knitted his brows and rejoined, after a moment or two, "'Inform Mrs. Finching, sir,' emphasising the name as if the innocent man was solely responsible for it. "'The chicken come up.' He had reflected, in his momentary pause, that unless she were admitted she might leave some message, or might say something below, having a disgraceful reference to that former state of existence. Hence the concession, and hence the appearance of Flora, piloted in by the man-man. "'I have not the pleasure,' said Mr. Dorrit, standing with the card in his hand, and with an air which imported that it would scarcely have been a first-class pleasure if he had had it, of knowing either this name or yourself, madam. Place a chair, sir. The responsible man, with a start, obeyed, and went out on tiptoe. Flora, putting aside her veil with a bashful tremor upon her, proceeded to introduce herself. At the same time a singular combination of perfumes was diffused through the room, as if some brandy had been put by mistake in a lavender water bottle, or as if some lavender water had been put by mistake in a brandy bottle. I beg Mr. Dorrit to offer a thousand apologies, and indeed they would be far too few for such an intrusion which I know must appear extremely bold in a lady and alone too, but I thought it best upon the whole, however difficult and even apparently improper, though Mr. F. Sand would have willingly accompanied me, and as a character of great force and spirit would probably have struck one possessed of such a knowledge of life, as no doubt with so many changes must have been acquired. For Mr. F. himself said frequently that, although well educated in the neighbourhood of Blackheath, at as high as eighty guineas, which is a good deal for parents, and the plate kept back to on going away, but that is more a meanness than its value, that he had learned more in his first years as a commercial traveller with a large commission on the sale of an article that nobody would hear of much less by, which preceded the wine trade a long time, than in the whole six years in that academy conducted by a college bachelor, though why a bachelor more clever than a married man I do not see and never did, but pray excuse me, that is not the point. Mr. Dorrit stood rooted to the carpet, a statue of mystification. I must openly admit that I have no pretensions, said Flora, but having known the dear little thing which under altered circumstances appears a liberty, but is not so intended, and goodness knows there was no favour in half a crown a day to such a needle as herself, but quite the other way, and as to anything lowering in it far from it the labourer is worthy of his hire, and I am sure I only wish he got it oftener and more animal food and less rheumatism in the back and legs poor soul. Madam, said Mr. Dorrit, recovering his breath by a great effort, as the relict of the late Mr. Finching stopped to take hers. Madam, said Mr. Dorrit, very red in the face, 
if I understand you to refer to uh, to anything in the antecedents of um, a daughter of mine, involving her uh, daily compensation, madam, I beg to observe that the uh, fact, assuming it heard to be fact, never was within my knowledge. Um, I should not have permitted it. Uh, never, never. Unnecessary to pursue the subject, returned Flora, and would not have mentioned it on any account except as supposing it a favourable and only letter of introduction, but as to being fact no doubt whatever, and you may set your mind at rest, for the very dress I have on now can prove it, and sweetly made, though there is no denying that it would tell better on a better figure, for my own is much too fat, though how to bring it down I know not. Pray excuse me, I am roving off again." Mr. Dorrit backed to his chair in a stony way, and seated himself, as Flora gave him a softening look, and played with her parasol. "'The dear little thing,' said Flora, "'having gone off perfectly limp and white, and called in my own house, or at least papa's, for though not a freehold, still a long lease at a peppercorn on the morning when Arthur, foolish habit of our youthful days, and Mr. Clennam far more adapted to existing circumstances, particularly addressing a stranger and that stranger a gentleman in an elevated station, communicated the glad tidings imparted by a person of the name of Panks emboldens me. At the mention of these two names, Mr. Dorrit frowned, stared, frowned again, hesitated with his fingers at his lips, as he had hesitated long ago, and said, "'Do me a favour to uh, state your pleasure, madam.' "'Mr. Dorrit,' said Flora, "'you are very kind in giving me permission, and highly natural it seems to me that you should be kind, for though more stately I perceive a likeness filled out of cause, but a likeness still. The object of my intruding is my own without the slightest consultation with any human being, and most decidedly not with Arthur, Pray excuse me, Doyce and Clennam. I don't know what I am saying, Mr. Clennam Solus, for to put that individual linked by a golden chain to a purple time, when all was ethereal out of any anxiety, would be worth to me the ransom of a monarch. Not that I have the least idea how much that would come to, but using it as the total of all I have in the world and more. Mr. Dorrit, without greatly regarding the earnestness of these latter words, repeated, State your pleasure, madam. "'It's not likely I will know,' said Flora. "'But it's possible, and being possible, when I had the gratification of reading in the papers, that you had arrived from Italy, and were going back, I made up my mind to try it, for you might come across him, or hear something of him, and if so, what a blessing and relief to all!' "'Allow me to ask, madam,' said Mr. Dorrit, with his ideas in wild confusion. "'To whom, uh, to whom?' He repeated it with a raised voice in mere desperation. You at present allude to the foreigner from Italy who disappeared in the city, as no doubt you have read in the papers equally with myself, said Flora, not referring to private sources by the name of Panks, from which one gathers what dreadfully ill-natured things some people are wicked enough to whisper, most likely judging others by themselves, and what the uneasiness and indignation of Arthur, quite unable to overcome it, Doyce and Clenham, cannot fail to be. It happened, fortunately for the elucidation of any intelligible result, that Mr. Dorrit had heard or read nothing about the matter. This caused Mrs. Finching, with many apologies for being in great practical difficulties as to finding the way to her pocket among the stripes of her dress, at length to produce a police handbill, setting forth that a foreign gentleman of the name of Blandois, last from Venice, had unaccountably disappeared on such a night in such a part of the city of London, that he was known to have entered such a house at such an hour, that he was stated by the inmates of the house to have left it about so many minutes before midnight, and that he had never been beheld since. This, with exact particulars of time and locality, and with a good detailed description of the foreign gentleman who had so mysteriously vanished, Mr. Dorrit read at large. Blandois, said Mr. Dorrit, Venice, and this description. I know this gentleman. He has been in my house. He is intimately acquainted with a gentleman of good family, but in different circumstances, of whom I am a patron. 
Then my humble and pressing entreaty is the more, said Flora, that in travelling back you will have the kindness to look for this foreign gentleman along all the roads and up and down all the turnings, and to make inquiries for him at all the hotels and orange trees and vineyards and volcanoes and places for he must be somewhere. And why doesn't he come forward and say he's there and clear all parties up? Pray, madam, said Mr. Dorrit, referring to the handbill again, who is Clenham and Company? Ah, uh, I see the name mentioned here, in connection with the occupation of the house which Monsieur Blandois was seen to enter. Who is Clenham and Company? Is it the individual of whom I had formerly um, some uh, slight transitory knowledge, and to whom I believe you have referred? Is it uh, that person? It's a very different person indeed, replied Flora with no limbs and wheels instead, and the grimmest of women, though his mother. Clenham and company? Uh, uh, him uh, uh, a mother? exclaimed Mr. Dorrit. And an old man besides, said Flora. Mr. Dorrit looked as if he must immediately be driven out of his mind by this account. Neither was it rendered more favourable to sanity, by Flora's dashing into a rapid analysis of Mr. Flintwinch's cravat, and describing him without the lightest boundary line of separation between his identity and Mrs. Clenham's as a rusty screw in gaiters, which compound of man and woman, no limbs, wheels, rusty screw, grimness and gaiters, so completely stupefied Mr. Dorrit that he was a spectacle to be pitied. "'But I would not detain you one moment longer,' said Flora, upon whom his condition wrought its effect, though she was quite unconscious of having produced it. If you would have the goodness to give your promise as a gentleman that both in going back to Italy and in Italy too, you would look for this Mr. Blandois high and low, and if you found or heard of him, make him come forward for the clearing of all parties. By that time Mr. Dorrit had so far recovered from his bewilderment as to be able to say, in a tolerably connected manner, that he should consider that his duty. Flora was delighted with her success, and rose to take her leave. "'With a million thanks,' said she, "'and my address upon my card in case of anything to be communicated personally, I will not send my love to the dear little thing, for it might not be acceptable, and indeed there is no dear little thing left in the transformation, so why do it, but both myself and Mr. F. Sand, ever wish her well, and lay no claim to any favour on our side. You may be sure of that, but quite the other way for what she undertook to do she did, and that is more than a great many of us do, not to say anything of her doing it as well as it could be done, and I myself am one of them, for I have said ever since I began to recover the blow of Mr. Ev's death, that I would learn the organ of which I am extremely fond, but of which I am ashamed to say I do not yet know a note. Good evening. When Mr. Dorrit, who attended her to the room door, had had a little time to collect his senses, he found that the interview had summoned back discarded reminiscences which jarred with the Myrtle dinner table. He wrote and sent off a brief note excusing himself for that day, and ordered dinner presently in his own rooms at the hotel. He had another reason for this. His time in London was very nearly out, and was anticipated by engagements. His plans were made for returning, and he thought it behoved his importance to pursue some direct inquiry into the Blandois disappearance, and be in a condition to carry back to Mr. Henry Gowan the result of his own personal investigation. He therefore resolved that he would take advantage of that evening's freedom to go down to Clenham and Companies, easily to be found by the direction set forth in the handbill, and see the place and ask a question or two there himself. Having dined as plainly as the establishment and the courier would let him, and having taken a short sleep by the fire for his better recovery from Mrs. Finching, he set out in a hackney cabriolet alone. The deep bell of St. Paul's was striking nine, as he passed under the shadow of Temple Bar, headless and forlorn in these degenerate days. As he approached his destination through the by-streets and waterside ways, that part of London seemed to him an uglier spot at such an hour than he had ever supposed it to be. Many long years had passed since he had seen it. 
he had never known much of it, and it wore a mysterious and dismal aspect in his eyes. So powerful was his imagination impressed by it, that when his driver stopped, after having asked the way more than once, and said to the best of his belief this was the gateway they wanted, Mr. Dorrit stood hesitating, with the coach door in his hand, half afraid of the dark look of the place. Truly, it looked as gloomy that night as even it had ever looked. Two of the handbills were posted on the entrance wall, one on either side, and as the lamp flickered in the night air, shadows passed over them, not unlike the shadows of fingers following the lines. A watch was evidently kept upon the place. As Mr. Dorrit paused, a man passed in from over the way, and another man passed out from some dark corner within, and both looked at him in passing, and both remained standing about. As there was only one house in the enclosure, there was no room for uncertainty, so he went up the steps of that house and knocked. There was a dim light in two windows on the first floor. The door gave back a dreary, vacant sound, as though the house were empty. But it was not, for a light was visible, and a step was audible, almost directly. They both came to the door, and a chain grated, and a woman with her apron thrown over her face and head stood in the aperture. "'Who is it?' said the woman. "'Mr. Dorrit, much amazed by this appearance, replied that he was from Italy, and that he wished to ask a question relative to the missing person whom he knew. "'Hi!' cried the woman, raising a cracked voice. "'Jeremiah!' Upon this, a dry old man appeared, whom Mr. Dorrit thought he identified by his gaiters, as the rusty screw. The woman was under apprehensions of the dry old man, for she whisked her apron away as he approached, and disclosed a pale affrighted face. "'Open the door, you fool,' said the old man, "'and let the gentleman in.' Mr. Dorrit, not without a glance over his shoulder towards his driver and the cabriolet, walked into the dim hall. "'Now, sir,' said Mr. Flintwinch, "'you can ask anything here you think proper. "'There are no secrets here, sir.' Before a reply could be made, a strong, stern voice, though a woman's, called from above, "'Who is it?' "'Who is it?' returned Jeremiah. "'More inquiries. A gentleman from Italy. "'Bring him up here.' Mr. Flintwinch muttered, as if he deemed that unnecessary but, turning to Mr. Dorrit, said, "'Mrs. Clennam, she will do as she likes. I'll show you the way.' He then preceded Mr. Dorrit up the blackened staircase. That gentleman, not unnaturally looking behind him on the road, saw the woman following, with her apron thrown over her head again in her former ghastly manner. Mrs. Clennam had her books open on her little table. "'Oh!' said she abruptly, as she eyed her visitor with a steady look. "'You are from Italy, sir, are you? Well?' Mr. Dorrit was at a loss for any more distinct rejoinder at the moment than, uh, "'Well?' "'Where is the missing man? Have you come to give us information where he is? I hope you have.' "'So far from it, I uh, have come to seek information. Unfortunately for us, there is none to be got here.' Flintwinch, show the gentleman the handbill. Give him several to take away. Hold the light for him and read it. Mr. Flintwinch did as he was directed, and Mr. Dorrit read it through as if he had not previously seen it. Glad enough of the opportunity of collecting his presence of mind, which the air of the house and of the people in it had a little disturbed. While his eyes were on the paper, he felt that the eyes of Mr. Flintwinch and of Mrs. Clennam were on him. Found, when he looked up, that this sensation was not a fanciful one. "'Now you know as much,' said Mrs. Clennam, "'as we know, sir. Is Mr. Blandois a friend of yours?' "'No, uh, an acquaintance,' answered Mr. Dorrit. "'You have no commission for him, perhaps?' "'I? Uh, certainly not.' The searching look turned gradually to the floor, after taking Mr. Flintwinch's face in its way. Mr. Dorrit, 
discomfited by finding that he was the questioned instead of the questioner, applied himself to the reversal of that unexpected order of things. "'I am a gentleman of property, at present residing in Italy with my family, my servants, and my rather large establishment, being in London for a short time on affairs connected with her, my estate, and hearing of this strange disappearance, I wished to make myself acquainted with the circumstances at first hand, because there is um, an English gentleman in Italy, whom I shall no doubt see on my return, who has been in habits of close and daily intimacy with Monsieur Blandois, Mr. Henry Gowan. You may know the name. Never heard of it. Mrs. Clennam said it, and Mr. Flintwinch echoed it. "'Wishing to uh, make the narrative coherent and consecutive to him,' said Mr. Dorrit, "'may I ask, say, three questions?' Thirty, if you choose.' "'Have you known Monsieur Blandois long?' "'Not a twelve-month. Mr. Flintwinch here will refer to the books and tell you when, and by whom at Paris he was introduced to us. If that,' Mrs. Clennam added, should be any satisfaction to you. It is poor satisfaction to us. Have you seen him often? No, twice, once before, and that once, suggested Mr. Flintwinch. And that once. Pray, madam, said Mr. Dorrit, with a growing fancy upon him as he recovered his importance, that he was in some superior way in the commission of the peace. Pray, madam, may I inquire, for the greater satisfaction of the gentleman whom I have the honour to uh, retain, or protect, or, let me say to her, um, no, uh, to know, was Monsieur Blandois here on business on the night indicated in this present sheet? On what he called business, returned Mrs. Clennam. Is, uh, excuse me, is its nature to be communicated? No. It was evidently impracticable to pass the barrier of that reply. "'The question has been asked before,' said Mrs. Clennam, "'and the answer has been no. We don't choose to publish our transactions, however unimportant, to all the town. We say no.' "'I mean, he took away no money with him, for example?' said Mr. Dorrit. "'He took away none of ours, sir, and got none here.' "'I suppose,' observed Mr. Dorrit, glancing from Mrs. Clennam to Mr. Flintwinch, and to Mr. Flintwinch from Mrs. Clennam, "'you have no way of accounting to yourself for this mystery.' "'Why do you suppose so?' rejoined Mrs. Clennam. Disconcerted by the cold and hard inquiry, Mr. Dorrit was unable to assign any reason for his supposing so. "'I account for it, sir.' she pursued after an awkward silence on Mr. Dorrit's part, by having no doubt that he is travelling somewhere or hiding somewhere. Do you know uh, why he should hide anywhere? No. It was exactly the same no as before, and put another barrier up. You asked me if I accounted for the disappearance to myself, Mrs. Clennam sternly reminded him, not if I accounted for it to you, I do not pretend to account for it to you, sir. I understand it to be no more my business to do that than it is yours to require that. Mr. Dorrit answered with an apologetic bend of his head. As he stepped back, preparatory to saying he had no more to ask, he could not but observe how gloomily and fixedly she sat with her eyes fastened on the ground, and a certain air upon her of resolute waiting. Also, how exactly the self-same expression was reflected in Mr. Flintwinch, standing at a little distance from her chair, with his eyes also on the ground, and his right hand softly rubbing his chin. At that moment, Mistress Affery, of course the woman with the apron, dropped the candlestick she held, and cried out, There! Oh, good Lord! There he is again! Hark, Jeremiah! Now! If there were any sound at all, it was so slight that she must have fallen into a confirmed habit of listening for sounds. But Mr. Dorrit believed he did hear a something, like the falling of dry leaves. The woman's terror, for a very short space, seemed to touch the three. 
and they all listened. Mr. Flintwinch was the first to stir. Afri, my woman, he said, sidling at her with his fists clenched, and his elbows quivering with impatience to shake her. You are at your old tricks. You'll be walking in your sleep next, my woman, and playing the whole round of your distempered antics. You must have some physic. When I have shown this gentleman out, I'll make you up such a comfortable dose, my woman, such a comfortable dose. It did not appear altogether comfortable in expectation to Mistress Affery, but Jeremiah, without further reference to his healing medicine, took another candle from Mrs. Clennam's table and said, Now, sir, shall I light you down? Mr. Dorrit professed himself obliged, and went down. Mr. Flintwinch shut him out, and chained him out, without a moment's loss of time. He was again passed by the two men, one going out and the other coming in, got into the vehicle he had left waiting, and was driven away. Before he had gone far, the driver stopped to let him know that he had given his name, number, and address to the two men on their joint requisition, and also the address at which he had taken Mr. Dorrit up, the hour at which he had been called from his stand, and the way by which he had come. This did not make the night's adventure run any less hotly in Mr. Dorrit's mind, either when he sat down by his fire again, or when he went to bed. All night he haunted the dismal house, saw the two people resolutely waiting, heard the woman with her apron over her face cry out about the noise, and found the body of the missing Blandois, now buried in the cellar, and now bricked up in a wall. End of chapter the seventeenth, book the second of Little Dorrit. This recording is in the public domain.